assured me that my story is relevant today. Um, so I'm, I'm very much trust him. Um, so something you might, some of you know this, and some of you might not. But I was, I was born in Galt, and some of you of a certain age are going to know possibly that Galt is now Cambridge. Um, it was the amalgamation, it doesn't really matter, amalgamation of Galt, Ruxton, and Hensler, and, and that's where I, I grew up. But in a sense, I, I didn't grow up in Galt at all, because I, I grew up in a kind of nowhere land in, in a place that was called Galt. Galt was neither a large town nor a small town. Uh, I didn't live downtown with the, with the wonderful old Victorian houses or by the river with the, you know, kind of suspect, run-down houses. Um, I lived in a new suburb, which could have been anywhere. You know, one of those those new suburbs in the 60s with, you know, little tiny bungalows plunked down on their own little postage stamp of lawn with a hopeful sapling kind of planted right there. And, you know, new families came in. So it, it was kind of, it, it wasn't even in town, <coughs> in the country. And um, it, it was just this, this kind of limbo. But, I, but I'm not really talking about golf today. I just wanted to give you a sense of the setting. I'm talking about a particular day. It was a March day, 1964. I was seven years old. And the week before, uh, my homeroom teacher, Mrs. McBride, had given us an assignment. She'd handed out uh, a number of, of those mimeographed um, sheets, you know, the ones that really smell and really <laughs> smell and really good. And um, on each of these sheets, there was a poem. And, and they were very worthy poems. Um, there was the words were, if I wandered lonely as a cloud, vespers, eighty milm, how doth the little crocodile by uh, Lewis, uh, Car Lewis Carroll. And of course, uh, Robbie Burns, a nice selection of Robbie Burns, which was Mrs. McBride's favorite <laughs> poet. She could not touch. And uh, I have to say, I was unimpressed with the selection. Uh, so after school, I stayed behind, and I lingered by Mrs. McBride's desk until she looked up from her papers, and she said, yes, Jenny, what is it? Speak right up. Um, speak up, Jenny. I think we're always wanting to speak up. And I said, well, um, would it be okay if I picked a different poem? Yes, yes, she said, of course. She, she, and I have, to, I have to tell you a bit of it about Mrs. McBride. Is that she, she was an older lady, at least she seemed ancient to me. And uh, she, was, she was rather stout and solid person. She wore tweeds like armor. Uh, and a crisp white blouse with a brooch, and very sensible brooms. <laughs> and her face was great too, because she had, you know, she had spectacles, but she also had a round face, and there were deep, concentric circles, several of them, underneath her eyes, one for each year of her teaching career. <laughs> Anyway, I left that classroom ecstatic. I was on winged sandals. I had a poem in mind. I had almost memorized the whole thing. So I went home. Now, I have to tell you also, because this is important to the picture, a little bit about, about me at that age. Um, I was seven. I was really tiny for my age, like really tiny. I looked like I was in kindergarten. Really scrawny, pale. I had an unfortunate overbite with a receding chin um, and scraggly hair that I wore over my face as much as possible to hide said chin. And I also was cursed with glasses, which was unforgivable in 1964 as a child. They were those, you know, cat eye things. Right? But I always took them off whenever I was, you know, at parties or, you know, had to meet relatives or any, anywhere where, you know. I felt self conscious, which was most of the time. And um, I was bullied, of course. And um, so, this, skipping ahead, you get the picture. Um, so, anyway, the day of the poetry reading came, and I was thrilled. And I put on my special green tights, the ones your mother shakes you into. They were kind of baggy at the knees, I think, those stick legs. And one of those big parkas, it was a blustery March day, you were marching for the Lion. And 
and I talk about to school. And the poet, I have to tell you, the poem was Horatius, or sometimes Horatius at the Bridge by Lord Macaulay. I love this poem. And it was about a centurion, so, or maybe not a centurion, a captain of the gate, Horatius, who with two friends held off the entire Etruscan army. What they had to do was go to the far side of one of the bridges that crossed the Tiber River, which was where the army was going to attack. And they had to hold back the army until the citizens on the other side could hew down the bridge so that the Etruscan army couldn't get across. That was, that was what the poem was about. Anyway, it was, it was sitting in class and Janet Green had just murdered I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. I didn't like <laughs> Janet Green very much. <laughs> Speak up, Jenny. Remember to speak up. And I took a deep breath. And I suddenly, that poem, that glorious poem, poured into my heart. Lars Porsena of Clusium, by thy nine gods he swore that the great house of Tarquin would suffer wrong no more. By the nine gods he swore it, and named that Tristan Jenny. Yes, Mrs. McBride. <laughs> Jenny, how long is this poem? <laughs> <laughs> 500 lines, but I'm so sorry. I only memorized 200 of them. <laughs> Jenny, there are other people in the class. You need to keep it short. Why don't you just pick a short verse from the poem and, and just just re, just recite that. Well, I had just one. It's my favorite part. Oh, my God. <laughs> On the low hills to westward, the consul fixed his eye and saw the swarthy storm of dust rise fast along the sky. And nearer, fast and nearer, doth the pale whirlwind come, and louder still, and still more loud, from underneath that rolling cloud is heard the trumpets worn all proud, the trembling and the hum. And plainly, and more plainly now, through the gloom appears, far to left and far to right, in broken streams of dark blue light, Long array of spears. Thank you, Jenny. You may sit down now. <laughs> <laughs> and something just shrank inside me. And my face, the blood rushed on my face. I just felt hot shame running through every fiber of my being. And I made my way back to my desk. I felt like I something, something terribly, terribly wrong, but I had no idea what it was. A silence had descended over the classroom, and it quickly revived once Billy McBain got up to recite How Doth the Little Crocodile, although I remember very little of the rest of the day. It passed in a kind of shameful blur. I was leaving school, I remember, I was leaving school that afternoon, four o'clock, and I had to walk through that, that great arena, the Colosseum that all children know, where there are gladiators and victims and animals, as we all know, in the, in the school, schoolyard, that infamous place. And as I was walking, the shame still burning on my face, something of the poem, revived itself in my soul. And I looked and I, I saw the giggling girls, Janet Green and her friends all giggling in the corner. And I saw Wayne and Blaine, my twin nemesis who liked to rub my face in the mud. Mm -hmm. And the words, 
again rose in my heart. For Romans in Rome's glory cared not for land nor gold, nor son, nor wife, nor limb, nor life in the brave days of old. And I strode through that playground on my spindly little green legs <laughs> like a centurion. Thank <laughs> you.